welcome to what is a first for me and a first for quarterly rep talks. So I've actually recorded live a presentation with an audience. Hope you're going to enjoy it. I hope you're going to give quarter deck talks a follow and have a look at what they're doing and their excellent series of talks they've got running in Portsmouth. Really do deserve a lot of support and if anyone's invited to go speak there, go. It's an amazing experience. I'll also add that my phone, after recording over an hour of me talking, and this talk actually ran out for the last one minute and didn't record the last minute. So I'm going to add on a minute at the end where I finish off the conclusion, the summary, like this. I do apologise. In future, I'll make sure I have a lot more space left on my memory. Take care. Hope you enjoyed the talk and have a nice day. Right, I am Alex Clark. Um, I'm not going to make Kate give me an introduction because possibly a lot of you follow me on Twitter, or if you don't, then you're very sensible. I would recommend not doing so. Right, so today is more than just a question of geography, and this is an important thing. I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about the Royal Navy in the war years, and I spend a lot of time with people telling me, ah, oh, the Royal Navy were doing nothing. The Royal Navy weren't prepared for World War II. They didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea of the air war. They had no idea of anything. They had no plans. And people don't tend to like my one word responses. Um, so this is a slightly more complicated response. Earlier this year, I did a big lecture at King's, which was on what they were procuring, what they were building. So I will skip through that a bit because we've only got 30 minutes today and I don't want to talk to you too much. But I can. I just want to be done. So, grand strategy, geo strategy. The amount of times I hear these phrases used by people and they're going, they're different things. They're actually different perspectives on the same thing. One of them is the modern twist on what in the 1930s would have been considered grand strategy. And grand strategy at that time was very simple. It was, what is our position of what are our weaknesses and how do we defend them? And the Royal Navy had the biggest weakness in the world to defend. It had an empire whose communications were entirely external. If you think about that, if we talk about World War I and we're talking about the German powers, the uh, Earth position powers, their communication lines were entirely internal, so they could communicate and move around easily. For the British Empire, the lines of communication were entirely external. They all went around the sea, they went around the world, they were able to be attacked. And the good example, of course, is what the Grass Bay gets up to at the beginning of World War II. But they had some plans for how to do this and for how they were going to deal with these problems. The Royal Navy's main idea for dealing with this was actually what would be modern terms called an offset strategy. The Royal Navy's biggest idea was we will fight at night when no one else will do so. And this is something they achieved long before anyone else. So when we're talking about World War II, one of the things that often is brought up is Pearl Harbor, and that it was taken, the Japanese took the idea from Taranto, which they did, to an extent. But what they didn't do was attack at night. Imagine how much worse it would have been for the Americans if they had. The reason they didn't attack one night wasn't because they didn't want to, it was because they couldn't. Their pilots couldn't fly at night. So what the Royal Navy achieved with a very few bombers at night from one carrier, the Japanese to achieve a similar level from a larger opponent, a similar level of damage, had to use far more aircraft and far more carriers and a far more difficult operation to mount. And the difference is fighting at night, because the Italians at night were even less prepared than the Americans at night. So. <laughs> Binding the disparate parts of empire and bringing together as strongly as possible is the one which often causes the most fun when I bring it up. And the point I would make with this one is why does the Royal Navy call its most important destroyers prior to World War II the tribal class? I know. It's quite simple. How do you make the Gurkhas very proud of the Royal Navy? You have HMS Gurkha. <laughs> And this is, by the way, a ship which sinks charging an air attack, so it does live up to the Gurkha name, very much so. Not many ships have gone down charging an air attack. And it succeeded in its mission because it managed to stop the air attack getting through to the convoy merchant ships, which were even less protected than it was. 
but it's not really the way you'd want a ship to do on an air attack. So, here is the reality of the Royal Navy in 1930s. These are all the ships which matter, the merchant ships which matter. It's a lovely, complicated plan. What makes the merchant ship matter? Well, it has to be above 3,000 tonnes. So if you're talking again about what happened at the beginning of World War II with the Grass Bay, those were the targets it rarely found. Mostly it was finding the ones below 3,000 gross tonnes. These are the ships which matter because these are the ships which move the large percentage of trade for Britain, but also which do long-range voyages and which in wartime would be critical to moving forces around the world. Yes, you could use smaller ships, Yes, they'd be viable, but the bigger ships were the critical ones for moving, especially a mechanised force. And remember, the other thing the Royal Navy has to contend with is which is the only army in the world which is completely mechanised? It's the British Army. So the Royal Navy is the only navy in the world which has to look at its army and go, I have to get you everywhere and you have these big, blooming vehicles. Horses are quite easy to move. They self-propel themselves onto a ship if you put in the right ranks. The vehicles of the time don't. It's complicated moving them. You know, the, uh, the army's advancement is being very annoying to the Royal Navy's logistics plans here. Do they care? No. So this is what the Royal Navy has to defend. And please do note where there are quite thick black lines and very thin black lines. Because this explains what comes next. The Royal Navy's command strategy for the world. If you notice, the commands which have very thin black lines going through them are the ones which are quite massive commands. The ones which had a lot of black, of black going through them are the slightly smaller commands. Anyone would think that someone was thinking about convoy and merchant sea and protection of trade when they were designing the command map. And they did quite well. Now, We'll be getting more into the command structures used in the interwar years later on when we're talking about the theatres and the response the Royal Navy had to them. But I want you to think about this in terms of what happens in World War II. The Royal Navy's two principal theatres that it thought war fighting was going to happen was be in the Far East and would be in this area, which they had divided up into two commands, Home and Mediterranean. They divided between those simply because they thought of the complexity of dealing with the Mediterranean. They thought about the complexity of dealing with a scenario where they were going to be entirely surrounded by enemies. And they weren't sure who they were going to fight in the Mediterranean. There were plans for dealing with the Spanish, the Italians, the French. I know, we don't think of them as being a potential opponent, but even in the interwar years, they occasionally got fractious, and the Royal Navy keeps a plan. Probably still very secretly somewhere might maybe have a plan for the war with America should it be necessary. Although that's probably swiftly followed by the sinking of most of the Royal Navy because even we'll run out of missiles before the Americans will. <coughs> Would probably do a good show though. Yeah. Considering last time we had one, we did turn the White House white. Now, the Far East, it's all centered on the China Command. Now, the China station is always a very interesting station because if you're looking at the number of ships they have, it should be a very junior officer out there in terms of admirals in command. It's always actually a very senior admiral, almost as if the Royal Navy is prepared for, we might have to send a fleet there rapidly and we want someone who can take command of the fleet if it's dispatched. So it's always a very a surprisingly senior officer for what its posting is. He also has the job of the Australian, New Zealand, and East Indies commands will come straight under his command. So in wartime, he would have command of that whole area to draw resources from. In fact, he'd arguably have the largest cruiser force in the Royal Navy the moment a war happened to do his job. His job's quite interesting. We'll get into it in a bit. But also, one of the interesting things about these commands is the Royal Navy starts to put forward specialists. So this is like with the Foreign Office, where they have junior rest of people will go out to certain postings and then they'll come home and then they'll go back out as a more senior posting or someone else. So, for example, when we're talking about, again, the Battle of River Plate, 
and we're talking about the ambassador involved in that. Milton Drake had been in South America 14 years out of his 23 years of service in 1939. I think that's right, I'm sure it's 27, but it's 14 years of service he'd been in South America. And this is an important thing because it means he knows his area. But Commodore Harwood also knows his area. He spent about 15 years, various on and off, going down to South America. He know, arguably is one of the people who knows the South America and South Atlantic better than any other officer in the Royal Navy. And it's not any surprise he's out there. If we look at the Far East, there are the Ashburns and various other senior officers who spend pretty much all their careers, and you sometimes find entire generations of them sitting out in the Far East. Fathers, uncles, and sons, nephews, all out serving together, and then they'll come home, and then the next generation will go out some more senior and these things. This is to build up institutional knowledge in the area. <laughs> the Royal Navy isn't just turning up on occasion. It's there, and it's staying there. And it knows what's there. So, all this is lovely, but it doesn't matter if you don't have the ships to actually do it. And this gets me onto my favourite character of the Royal Navy in 1939. He's a guy called Admiral Henderson, and he's possibly the most forgotten person in the world. And he shouldn't be. And I will spend a lot of my life shouting about him, because he is a theorist. He has a long naval career, including he's the guy who makes the paper which produces the convoy system for the Royal Navy in World War One, But to protect him, Jellicoe goes, I'm not sticking your name on this because people will hate it so much they will ruin your career for it. Instead, he gives him command of a battleship. Let's be honest, it, name on the paper or command of a battleship. There are academics in here who might go later, but let's be honest, most of us go, battleship. We want the battleship. And he did all sorts of things. He was an early convert to carrier warfare. And he was the first Rear Admiral aircraft carriers, which was instantly in a very similar post to our current um, officer who recently became the first commander of HMS Queen Elizabeth. As we all know, he was in charge of the process of finding the first commander for HMS Elizabeth. <coughs> Henderson was the person who wrote the paper about whether or not the Royal Navy needed a rear admiral air, admiral air guard carriers, <laughs> and then nominated himself for the job. <laughs> and the first sea lord signed off on it. So there is precedent for how to approach getting command in the Royal Navy. Write a paper saying you need to be in command, and then get the first sea lord to sign off on it. It works. So. He had a lot of fun with the Royal Air Force, and actually his, his main objection to the fleet's air arm being run by the Royal Air Force wasn't that the Royal Air Force were bad pilots not committed to it. It was the technical inefficiency of it. He, what he found annoying was he said the RAF are ignoring even their own single-engine fighter aircraft in favour of the bombers. How can we expect them to provide the Royal Navy with control or with you know, a good aircraft? And interesting enough, when the Royal Navy does get control of Fleet Air, I'm in 1939, properly under control, um, the first thing he does is order the Sabre and the Griffin engines. Now, if anyone knows about these engines, they're the 2,000 horsepower plus engines which the, uh, which the whole British Armed Forces depend upon for their aircraft from about 1942 onwards in World War II. The RAF and the Air Ministry hadn't ordered them because they didn't need them for multi-engine bombers because you just stuck on more engines. It was quite easy to have a very powerful Lancaster with 4,000 horsepower, that was four Merlin engines. But if you've got single-engine aircraft, you need a 2,000 horsepower engine to get that power. That's what the Americans have done, but it isn't what had been done in Britain because it hadn't been seen as being necessary. So what he does is he orders them. And they're critical, because if you think about the Fairy Albacore, which of course famously is outlasted by its predecessor, the Swordfish, the reason it's outlasted is because it's terrible, because it's got so little power. And that's because it, it's limited to a very weak engine for what it needs to do. So to carry a torpedo up there, you either need a lot of lift, or you need a very powerful engine, one of the two. 
The swordfish solves it by being very light, having a lot of wing space, and having a very, uh, having quite a powerful engine for its power to weight ratio. That type can carry a torpedo a long way. The albacore tries to uh, not be quite swordfish, not be quite anything, and gets into trouble. Now, for a long time, all I knew him by was his signature. <laughs> because finding pictures of Henderson was blooming impossible. And this is a great response, because this is his response to the first sea lord. When he's first sea lord, first sea lord says, I don't like your destroyer design. And I don't like it because the compliment will be too, small, uh, too big. He sends them a whole nice letter detailing the advantages. And then at the end, as the postscript, is what is the response to the first sea lord's main point. The compliment of the L class will be at least 30 less than that of the J class. The response that comes back from the first sea lord meeting is, how can you make this claim? And Henderson turns around and goes, the bigger destroyer design is actually easier to maintain because it's actually easier to get through to the components which need to be fixed and need to be maintained. So it's actually less man hours, which means I can have a smaller crew and still have better times for those crews, so better work. You think about the debates we have today about the size of ships. Actually, the bigger ships are actually easier to maintain because you can get around them. And it's very much the case with destroyers in the 1930s which are very, very small. Now, he achieved a lot. He actually ends up dying in 1940, just in 1940. And so he's completely written out all the history books post-World War II, when all these people are going, I'm the great admiral who saved the Royal Navy. So they quietly ignore Henderson. Because, of course, you can do that on the guy's dead in the nicest way. But it's interesting that the laurels they wrote for him in the Navy were, this was the man who won the war, this was the man who was critical. In Cunningham's response, this is Admiral Cunningham, of course, who commanded the Mediterranean fleet, he actually said the reason he stayed in command of the Mediterranean fleet for so long was because Henderson died, he didn't have a worthy successor. He wasn't prepared to come home because Henderson was the one who'd been slated to replace Cunningham in the Mediterranean fleet. And Cunningham knew how important the Mediterranean was because it was critical for everywhere for Britain. And therefore, he couldn't come home and couldn't command the, uh, the home fleet or do anything like that because there wasn't someone to succeed him who was capable of dealing with the job until it was a lot better. Basically, it wasn't about the naval war that Cunningham was worried about. It was the politics. And of course, his successor, Harwood, you know, down there would have a lot of trouble in the Mediterranean because of the politics of managing the RAF and the army and the different competings. Henderson was very good at the Navy stuff, but he was also very good at the politics. He managed to get a whole aircraft carrier built by calling it HMS Unicorn and claiming it was a forward support ship. <laughs> <laughs> he actually goes to Parliament and says, we need to build a forward support ship so we can work in the Far East. Yes, it looks like an aircraft carrier, but it isn't an aircraft carrier. And I'm calling it HMS Unicorn. Gets it through. He gets it through. He gets the fleet air arm back from the RAF, not by griping about different commands and all these things, but by talking with the politicians about the engineering difficulties and pointing to the US Navy, the Japanese Navy, their power to weight ratios, and going, in the nicest way, the problem for us isn't that the RAF are bad managers, it's that they're distracted managers. He's very, very nice about it. It's not the RAF aren't nasty guys, they're not bad He maintains very good relationships with them. And there is one very senior RAF officer who after World War II says the best thing for the RAF that happened in the post-war settlement was that Henderson wasn't around. Because if Henderson had been first sea lord after World War II, there might not have been an air force or an army. Because he was that good at making political cases. But this is what he looks at. I, did a talk at King's earlier this year, and one of the family of Henderson had to be down. He said, yes, we don't have any pictures publicly available, but we do have some we can send. We won't allow you to publish them, but you can use them in talks. Oh, thank you very much. So this is what Henderson looks like. He doesn't look like a cheeky sod, does he? But he is very much so. And he used to do these things like going for walks around the shipyard. He'd turn up on a Sunday at a shipyard or at the, one of the construction yards, and would walk around in a bowler hat and suit. 
He knew the shipyards amazingly well. Once in a meeting with directors of a company who were trying to tell him how much it would cost to build a destroyer design he was asking to build, he turned around and said, actually no, because you have the welding system and you have this many welders. I'm not going to The only way. Uh, it turned out the owner of the yard hadn't visited it in two years and didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> Henderson had been there every other every Sunday or so, well, one Sunday a month, for about the last two years by this point. He not only knew in the yard, he knew all the shift managers. They let him in. Those were days which were very different for a Royal Navy when it came to construction. It was far more difficult to argue with Admiral Henderson than it probably is current our animals about construction because, well, he also had the naval constructors and all sorts of people under his support. So he had a huge team as Bird Seagull <coughs> to basically manage construction and procurement. He could build the Navy he wanted. It also sort of, when I talk about him, gets me into trouble with people who um, eulogize Jackie Fisher because they think of him as the only admiral who was a theorist of the Royal Navy who built things. Actually, Henderson wasn't even the only other one. There are lots of admirals who are not very good at writing, but are very good at building their ideas. In fact, it's a far more common practice for the Royal Navy of history. The French admirals like to write papers, and so we talk <coughs> about them. They're far more easier to talk about in terms of historians. But the Royal Navy admirals like to build things. And they build a lot. So, <clears throat> let's start off with cruisers and destroyers. Now, I always put these two groups together because you have the tribal class sitting in between, but also because they are the working groups of the Royal Navy. They are what the Royal Navy is looking at around the world. And you have lots of issues. Now, I know, I've, the treaties I've got named there are Washington, London, and London 2.0. They do actually have their years. But honestly, their years are almost incidental. What matters is, as they go along, they get more and more restrictive. They have more and more elaborate ideas of how to manage fleets. And it's one of the things which makes the French war plans for war with Japan, if the Japanese invaded their Indochina and their areas in the Far East, really, really quite um, interesting because they predicate themselves on the French suddenly managing to rapidly double the size of their navy. This is one of the English translations I re I've read. I'm not quite sure about the translation quality, so I'll add that in. But it's an interesting time, and it ends up with the Royal Navy, if I've got this in the right order, going down the heavy destroyer route. Now, I know they're not all tribal class, and this is actually a picture I've nicked from my book I'm working on at the moment, so some shame of self-promotion is going on. <laughs> this, of course, is the tribal class. This is HMS Cossack. This is the ships which were supposed to take the place of cruisers in the Mediterranean and home fleet. Because if they took the play a role of cruisers on in those areas, that freed up cruisers to go to the Far East, to go to the South Atlantic, to go elsewhere in the world, where the Royal Navy really needed their cruisers. And the big problem for cruisers was that for an effective cruiser, you needed about eight to 10,000 tons as far as the Royal Navy worked for this in operations. So the big problem for the Royal Navy wasn't the individual ship and limitations, it was the limitations on total tonnage. So hence they used their super destroyers to build very light cruisers. But the Royal Navy finds these ships very useful. And in wartime, they are critical for commando operations and for all sorts of things. So in wartime, they find that they suddenly need to build more. So they go for the battle class, of which HMS Leeds is an Example here. And they are wartime production of a tribal class destroyer. They're basically the same size, but we're going to cram everything into it we can and we're going to see what comes up. They're a bit cramped. So, rather interestingly again, post Second World War, the Royal Navy builds the Daring class. I know, not the current ones we have sitting out there, but these ones. Now, they are some beautiful looking ships. And they are basically taking the tribal class ideas, the size, the space, the entertaining for diplomacy, for all these things, up, bigger, and making sure they work. There is a great line about these, which is in a report to, H uh, to Churchill when he's back as Prime Minister, because the Royal Navy is sending some out to Korea to take the place of cruisers. And he goes, 
I'm not worried about their ability to provide fire support. I'm sure that will be the case. What I'm worried about is can they fulfill the important duties of a cruiser? Diplomacy. He sent back a schematic and a map of all the spaces aboard, able for entertaining. He's satisfied. The point is, the Royal Navy, when you're building ships for war, you also have to build ships for peace. And that means diplomacy. <coughs> Which is the big trouble the Royal Navy has with these. They're the Dido class. They are stripped down war design for cruisers, really, although they're built before the war. And they are everything the Royal Navy thinks it needs in an essential cruiser but just about can fit in without it doing any of the cruiser jobs. In fact, in many ways, that's a light cruiser, that's a very heavy destroyer. Because this is all about war fighting, and this is about maintaining peace, as well as war. It's the interesting juxtaposition. Because when you look at the Royal Navy, when they're building something which is for war and peace, you have my favorite of the town class cruisers, who's also up there, HMS Birmingham, isn't she lovely? She takes place at an event called Sing Tower in January 1939. I will be explaining more about it later, but she's really, really critical and really quite pretty. Now, if you look at the size of the town class cruiser, and if you can go see HMS Belfast, their slightly bigger younger sister, you'll see how much space there is for entertaining, for diplomacy, for being impressive. If you consider compared to the Dido class, you suddenly see what the problem is for the Royal Navy in terms of cruisers if you're building them yeah. to fit within the limitations. You can build a cruiser which will do the fighting role of a cruiser, but that's not almost that, that's almost not as important as the peacetime role of a cruiser, the president. <laughs> which is why I was very, very happy with the selection for the Type 31 design. It's the biggest, so for presence missions. It's perfect because you've got lots of space to have people aboard and go, let's have a meeting, let's have, do some diplomacy, let's have a nice exercise, let's have a dinner, let's have this. All the engagement soft power duties, which actually are very critical for a Navy which wants to look after global trade. Right, so the traditional, when I'm reading historians, especially ones in the 1950s and 60s, they tell me, the Royal Navy was always going to go this way, that the Royal Navy was always going to go task forces of carriers and battleships, and they were always looking at that. Well, it's true that's what the Royal Navy was exercising, but honestly, the Royal Navy had many options, and it did consider them. Now, of course, HMS Ark Royal was often held up as being a super carrier <coughs> prior to World War II. And in fact, Henderson hated her, and quite a lot of the Navy did, because she was built on American lines. The idea being you have as much strike power in the ship as possible. She was built for one mission. Ideally, she should have been the ship launching the attack at Taranto, not Illustrious. The reason she should have been launching the attack was that was what her entire mission profile was. She was a strike carrier. So again, when I'm told the Queen of a class or something new being called strike carriers or something special, I sit there and smile and giggle a bit, because in the 1930s, the Royal Navy had a strike carrier called Ark Royal. That was what she was built for. These are what actually become the Genesis designs, and I could have put three, four classes of pictures there on here, or I can put these. I could put the Uni HMS Unicorn, I could put the Illustrious class, I could put Formidable, I could put Implacable, I could put all the light carriers all the designs come from these 1936 W and DB. These designs are critical. They are genesis for the Royal Navy's carrier project in World War II. They're where all the carriers come from. And they have armoured decks on the top. They are strong. They are sturdy. They are survivable. Why is the Royal Navy building carriers like this when everyone else is going for wooden decks for as much space for air groups as possible? The Royal Navy has two reasons. One, it has to fight in the Mediterranean, where you cannot get away from air power, no matter how hard you try. And whilst the RAF and the MSG are going, the bomb wars to get through, the Navy's not so keen on that idea, the Navy does reckon some are gonna leak through, especially pre-radar. So it makes sense to have armor. But the most important thing isn't actually the Mediterranean, it's the Far East. It's where they're going to be 
thousands upon thousands of miles away from their infrastructure base, from anything that can repair a carrier, from anything that can make their lives work if they get damaged. This is why you have an armoured carrier, something less likely to take <coughs> damage, and actually, because of its armour plate, because of its steel, actually easier to fix than the wooden decks. Because seasoned wood that can go on a flight deck is quite hard to maintain. You think about if you've ever been to Chatham, the huge sheds they have for storing seasoned wood for all these things. That's actually quite difficult to keep up, whereas steel plate you can store quite easily. And you can ship around quite easily. But there is also Frankenstein, and I always feel compelled to show people Frankenstein. <coughs> Frankenstein. The battle carrier. <laughs> the fusion of the power of a Nelson class battleship with the power of an illustrious class aircraft carrier. I'm not sure which particular admiral, I can't find an admiral's name attached to it at the moment, but it, well, there was an admiral involved who had this particular, there are children present so I can't use the phrase, but something dream, but um, someone did. It was not only the Royal Navy who considered this idea, many others did as well. It's frankly scary on so many levels. It makes the concept of the battle cruiser really worrying because if you have a battle carrier which has all these guns on it, at a certain point your aircraft carrier or battle carrier is going to end up in the firing line pummeling at the enemy battleships. And it's got a huge flat deck for plunging fire to come through and a lift dead center. This is really not a good idea on any concept. There are still people on Twitter who think this is the right one. <laughs> but it comes from more fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord. Don't get me started. The people on, who talk about the Queen Elizabeth class go, she should be bristling the missiles. I'm going, have you tried to operate an aircraft carrier when you've got one on the deck? <laughs> no. So let's move on to the deployments, the stuff about the geography. So we've got China and the East Indies. Now, this is what the China station looks like in terms of war fighting. That is the area you've got to cover. Think about that from a modern command perspective. If you're talking about the American command structure, there's three different commands in that area. And by the way, because there weren't equal officers from the other services, the Royal Navy commander, CNC of the China station, was in effect commander-in-chief British forces Far East, and they had a staff of 20. Everyone wants to imagine coordinating a Far East war, all services reporting to you with a staff of 20. If anyone feels the need to go outside and cry, I do understand. The first time I thought about it, I almost cried as well. And that's a staff of 20 if he's nicking people from his flagship. Now, plans were made for dealing with France, with America in the Far East, but it was always mainly Japan. The Royal Navy's main policy versus Japan was how can we terrorize them over all of this? We have to, because we can't fight them until the battle fleet arrives, and that could be weeks, months. So we have to come up with a way of striking fear into them while looking really nice. We have to make them afraid, but also not provoke them or give them a castle spell. How do you do that? How do you scare someone without actually provoking conflict? Well, there is a way. So, the policy is all about buying time, and the policy is very simple. It's cruisers, and they work very well. You have the, entire, uh, the Australian Navy, you have the New Zealand Navy, you have the 4th and 5th cruiser squadrons. You have, at some times, up to 15 cruisers sitting out in the Far East. Now, what would these cruisers be doing if there is a war with Japan until the battle fleet arrives. I've read some papers. 
Various people have ideas about them forming a battle fleet, like they actually started doing at certain points in World War II. They were, the commands decided to use them as these sort of task forces fighting like this. The Royal Navy's plans in interwar years, which were possibly some of the more sensible ones, were that the Royal Navy would use its surface raiders, aka the town class, which were of course the anti-surface raider cruisers, but um, you know, the same capabilities that make you very good at stopping and tracking down other surface raiders make you incredibly good at being a surface raider yourself. Oh. <laughs> and oh, by the way, um, town class has about 10 members, of which four are already in 1939, based in the Far East. Can't think why. And the other cruisers out there the Royal Navy has are the big county class cruisers. Again, all the newest variety of them. Yeah, they're not scaring Japan at all. After all, Japan has battleships, so how can they be scared of cruisers? Well, there's a very simple reason. The example I give is Singtai. In 1939, January, the Japanese take prisoner a British merchant ship. They say it's been doing naughty things and giving the Chinese aid and stopping where it shouldn't be. It actually had, but the British only really found out it had been afterwards, but that didn't stop them doing what they did next. HMS Birmingham, pictured up there, goes for a little trip. She takes a sloop along the bar. She goes into Singtel Harbour and she says, you're giving us back our merchant ship. Japanese going, no. The Royal Navy put a boarding party of a sub-lieutenant, a chief petty officer, and six ratings aboard her. You go, we're taking her out tomorrow morning. Japanese go, no. Morning. The sloop starts off first, and it goes at the front, then the merchant ship, and then HMS Birmingham. Slowly, the Japanese heavy cruisers, there are three of them sitting in harbour, turn all their guns to face Birmingham. So Birmingham turns all her guns to face them. The captain of Birmingham actually says at this point, aim the guns at their bridges. Make sure they know we'll kill them first. And they say around to the center, everyone pointing guns at each other. Three Japanese heavy cruisers just back down to a single Royal Navy light cruiser. Why? Were they scared of the single light cruiser? No. They were scared of what the other colleagues might be doing. Because the Japanese have all this trade going on. And actually, one of the biggest problems for the Royal Navy at the bit in 1939 that makes Japan really difficult to start dealing with is the Americans start really cutting down Japanese trade. So the Japanese trade lines, which would usually be going across the Atlantic, which were nice and easy for the Royal Navy to threaten with cruisers, started reducing because the Americans weren't lining the trade. Damn, damn short sighted Americans. They don't realize if you stop to trade with someone, you start you make it more difficult for you to strangle them. And so, that happens. But, don't worry, the Royal Navy still didn't stop there. In January 1940, they decided the Japanese needed a reminder. And there's never really an official discussion of this, but this just seems to happen. Some German merchant seamen are trying to get home from America. They go in a Japanese merchant ship called the Asama Maru. It gets stopped about here, within flying range of Japan. It gets stopped by HMS Liverpool, a town class cruiser, who has found her in the middle of the ocean. This one merchant ship stops her, puts on her jammers so she can't communicate with home, boards her, takes the German merchant seaman off her at gunpoint, and then says, carry on with your business. The Japanese raises think about this, but the Japanese high command then has to admit, the naval command, that they cannot protect their merchant ships from Royal Navy surface raiders. The British go, oh no, we won't do it again, we're sorry to cause such an upset. No, 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 the diplomats are furious with the Royal Navy. Don't, you don't do this, you don't do this, it's illegal to do it, even in international waters, you didn't have a reason. The Royal Navy goes, oh, don't worry, we'll have the merchant steam back. But the Royal Navy's made its point. We can find your trade anywhere. We can find a single merchant ship of all your merchant ships, which was carrying merchant seamen 
and we can find it close enough to your shore and you will still not be able to stop us. That's pretty scary. Let's be honest, that's Raw Navy basically going, come on, this is going to get hard. And they have all these ships out there. There are destroyers, there are all sorts of things. The destroyers and submarines role was primarily to protect and prevent basically any attacks coming into Singapore and other bases, to try and stop the attacks. The cruisers was to go on economic warfare, to go and take out the Japanese merchant fleet. But of course, you can't just plan for a war in the Far East as much as the Royal Navy would love to. And this also included, by the way, these war plans, a huge amount of fuel being stockpiled in Australia. Colossal amounts. And that fuel actually ended up being the fuel which supplied the British Pacific Fleet and most of the American operations in this part of the world for the whole of World War II, which had been stockpiled. So again, the idea of the Royal Navy not being prepared for war, not thinking about war in the Far East, not thinking about these things, is kind of wrong because they're putting all the infrastructure in place. Their big problem is they lose Singapore, which is basically their only infrastructure hub. That's pre-built prior to World War II in the Far East. And they arguably lose that one, not because of their own lack of preparation, but because one of the other services which they're relying on hadn't thought about how to defend it. Because they hadn't thought they were going to need to, because they thought the battle fleet would arrive in time. Despite the Royal Navy saying the battle fleet's never going to arrive in time, it's going to take weeks to get there. They were also upset with um, Churchill going, No idea why I decided to go backwards. <laughs> ah, fun times. So, deployments to Metrain. So, Metrain is slightly more complicated. And the pictures were supposed to come up after the text had been come up, but I'll just ignore that one. So, the text underneath it says the Mediterranean is very, very complicated for two major reasons. Not only is it the, uh, likely to become a war zone in terms of France, potentially, Russia being communist and being annoying, Italy being fascist and making declarations of Mare Nostrum about it, and Spain being Spain over Gibraltar. The Royal Navy had all these issues to deal with. They actually had long-term plans always in place for moving the fleet to Alexandria from Malta. They, these were not sudden decisions forced on them by war. They had long-term plans about when to move it. Malta was a great base in peacetime because it's this island fortress in the middle of the Mediterranean which makes your claim, this is our sea, we're here. In wartime, it's not really very practical. It's quite difficult to resupply, it's quite difficult to place a large fleet there, it's quite difficult to do all the things you need it for. So in wartime, it's not as useful. The Royal Navy knew this and had plans. But what they have in the Mediterranean is a huge fleet. They have everything there, including anti-submarine warfare trawlers. Now, why do you have anti-submarine warfare trawlers all deployed to the Mediterranean? because they are predicted on one of the eventualities being we might be having to convoy stuff through the Mediterranean to go and fight a war in the Far East. This is going to be the reaction force which will reach the Far East first. So this is why the Mediterranean fleet matters on one level. And again, you have quite a significant force structure. But what you do notice is it's quite light on cruisers. If the Mediterranean is your major fleet, and your critical fleet. Why is it light on cruisers? It doesn't need them. It has battleships and it has uh, tribal class destroyers, so it can do the peace uh, presence missions with these vessels. Cruisers are far more needed out further east. So in this case, you don't need them. And also, if it does go out to the far east, there's already plenty of cruisers out there for the cruiser jobs, for the scouting missions, for these things. So they're not needed. And one of the interesting things you have in 1939, in September, is that the tribal class destroyers are actually sitting the other side of the Suez Canal. They're sitting the other side. They're not in the Mediterranean, they're down south. 
And again, one of the interesting things for the Graf's Bay is if it had carried on up the, in, up the Indian Ocean shore of the coast of Africa, it would have bumped into a tribal class flotilla which were coming south at high speed. Uh, Captain Vian at that time was living up to his traditional reputation of there be enemy that direction, I'd be going. Unfortunately, they doubled back and so the tribals didn't get to add another laurel to their already excessive reef. And it's a fun time in the Mediterranean. They've got a lot of complications going on. Again, it's why you have another senior admiral. And there's always the debate over whether or not the Mediterranean commander would end up coming out to become the commander in the Far East. It depends on who you read and which books. If you read the Anne of the Royal Navy, um, own, its own documents, it's very vague on this matter. Theoretically, the Admiral-in-Chief of Mediterranean would come out with his fleet, but whether he would become Supreme Commander in the Far East is a very different matter. Remember, the Royal Navy already has this concept of strategic command and fleet command going on, and they might well have led, said Mediterranean Fleet Commander, OK, you command the battle fleet, you'll command the fleet, but the strategic commander, the Supreme Commander, will stay the CNC Far East because he knows the area best. It's quite a probable compromise the Royal Navy would reach. See, the text is coming up behind. <laughs> no idea what happened and why the animations haven't worked on them. Right, so the home fleet. Looks nice and easy, doesn't it? They have the Atlantic, they have this area. It looks like quite a simple command compared to the Far East. It's not. Because the home fleet itself divides into this. Just to give any admiral in charge a lot of headaches. So, for every single area you're talking of these ones, there is a senior admiral. It's the same for all of these. So, again, if we consider modern staff work, if you have about, after you sort out the various commands and the various different positions, a dozen commands of very senior admirals, but a three stars usually and above, to coordinate, I'm not surprised Pound develops a brain tumour. <laughs> what I'm surprised is how long it takes to port that. Um, and that feels rather cruel to say, but this is a very, very complicated command structure. It's interesting to note that when Cunningham does get commanded uh, of a uh, sort of he becomes the sea lord. One of the things he starts to do is to start to um, lean down the command structure as much as he can, coordinate who actually needs to be involved in what. And there were reasons for this command structure. It existed in the Napoleonic times, in similarities. It was a very good command structure for coordinating all the convoys going around the UK, especially, and this is one of the things I've often forgotten. We always talk about the convoys going to Arctic, going to Russia, and the convoys going to America. The convoys going around the coast of the UK are some of the most critical because the railway lines keep getting bombed, as do the roads. The ships going around the coast are bloody important. And defending them is a critical mission. But it does back up my earlier statement that the more command, smaller commands tend to associate where you have more of these little black dots, these 3,000 ton ships. You have tons of them coming in this area, you have tons of commands. You also have a distributed authority because you have a very different world going on for the home fleet commander and for all the missions they've got to do. You have a lot of complicated different personalities. Hello? Hello? Mm. Let's see if I can do it with a mouse. No. Now, oh, right. Connecting a smart device. Whose smartphone is playing hello? <laughs> it doesn't matter. So, you have all these different things. In one part, you have the American Navy, who are massive, but don't tend to go anywhere um, at this point. They don't. Uh, we, we, again, we talk about World War II. Everyone's talking about the huge fleet train the Americans produce and how they have these logistics for the Pacific War and all these things. They are lovely but in, they don't exist for most of the 1930s. 
These are things which come about later. The Americans are new in many ways. They're copying what the Royal Navy was already planning on doing, but the Royal Navy has a trouble building up a huge merchant fleet supply line for the Royal Navy in, 1930, in the late 1930s, especially after 1939. It needs the merchant ships built and maintained for actually doing the supplies for the country. So building ships which can supply your forward fleets is far more difficult, but still, they do have all the <coughs> You know, Commodore Harwood couldn't be doing all he was doing in the South Atlantic without actually having an on-call oiler to refuel him, because believe it or not, Falkland Islands doesn't have a lot of fuel load. And that's his major base. You know, we talk about Falkland Islands today. In World War II, the closest major facility, or the closest facility, let's be honest, not major, that Commodore Harwood has that he can call for a home port is the Falkland Islands. And it's critical, there's a reason ships are sent down there for their self-maintenance. Please note that phrase, self-maintenance. If they have to go for actual proper maintenance, it's Simonstown, Durban, Freetown, off on the Africa, where they have to go. Because again, you want to be very careful about sending them to Kingston and this area in Jamaica, because that can upset the Americans. And again, there aren't the facilities there. In reality, most of the ships, when they need to be properly maintained, are heading all the way back home. So this is why this is sort of one command structure, one area, because the infrastructure that exists to support it, mostly is that. So all of it's one structure. Right then, so here's the summary. The Royal Navy in 1939 is a global force. It has to be, because it's dealing with everyone. This can be the Japanese, it can be the Germans, it can be all the various powers. And if we consider the home fleet, of course, they're mainly dealing with the Germans, but they also have to think about the Americans. They have to again think about the French, they have to again think about the Russians. Mainly the major problem with the Russians is when they, ever they go to sea, they keep breaking down. <laughs> not going to make comments about today. Um, but well, they're getting better actually today, so we can't be that cruel, but they're doing well. But the Royal Navy has to think about the world. So when we have this perspective that the British forces aren't preparing for World War II sensibly, they are. The RAF might be fixated on the heavy bomb force, but that's because at that time, that was considered the best option for air power, because the bomb would always get through, because radar wasn't as common as it is now, as it became, and certainly not as well understood as it is now. So it, what the options were, the heavy bomber force. For the army, it was a mechanised force to go around the world. But for the Royal Navy, to be a global force meant already being there. You had to be forward deployed, you had to be present, and you had to build up institutional knowledge of those areas. You had to know them. The examples I give are usually the Far East, where you have the Ashworths who know pretty much everyone. It's amazing how many of them are intermarried. If you talk about Commodore Harwood and Millington Drake, and if you see the movie, The Battle of River Plate, it looks like they barely know each other. In reality, not only did they, they know each other, their wives were very good friends and had exchanged letters over the years. This is the reality of the scenario because these officers had been down there and had met the Foreign Service. If you want a global deployed Navy, you need a globally deployed diplomatic service and you need them to work together. And that's what the Royal Navy is doing. When you want to deter war with Japan, you have to talk about economic warfare because actually forward basing battleships out there is problematic. Because the moment you send any battleships out there, you're not going to be able to send as many as the Japanese Navy have, so you're just going to make yourself look weak. Hence, Churchill, in his lovely strategic vision, sends battleships out there. Goes, we have to send a battle fleet out there. One of goes, we don't want to send them because we can't send a carrier mode. No, 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 send the battleships. That will deter the Japanese. It doesn't. Because if you send two battleships, it shows you can only deploy two battleships. If I have a huge battle fleet and you can only deploy two battleships, which is like a fifth of my total force, why am I going to worry about you? Why do you matter? Whereas if you've got no battleships there, but there's the potential for you deploying a fleet in my mind, but you've got a lot of cruisers there, which are free because they don't have to look after battleships, so they can go and do what they like in my area of water, and I know exactly what HMS Liverpool got to, and I still have nightmares about her, and what she got up to, bucking a single merchant ship out of the, co uh, out of the water off my coast. Very rude. Very nasty. Terrible. Um, so, 
you worry about it, so you don't do it, because it's strategic uncertainty. And people, think, especially leaders of government countries, do not like strategic uncertainty. It doesn't make for a good scenario when you can't go, this is what's going to happen. If you're looking at South America, which was always going to be a surface rate of war, the Royal Navy again has cruisers down there, but it actually has its slightly less able by cruisers down there, but the Amber class are focused down there. They're not that less able, but they are less able than the town class. They don't carry as many aircraft, they don't, aren't as powerful, aren't as fast, aren't as large, but they are perfectly fine for going around the South America, making lots of port visits and making friends with everyone. And this is a good thing, because if you're managing South America and you don't want the Germans to get any support, and in which case the Grass Bay receives zero support from South America, think of all the German communities down there. Theoretically, they should have been in a really strong position. But the Royal Navy and the diplomatic corps have been doing such a little sterling work over the years, making so many contacts, that actually no one in government are really prepared to support it. So, the Royal Navy secures South America. In Africa, of course, Britain, British Empire is quite massive there, but you have the tribal class to build links with them. And let's be honest, the tribal class are really kind of interesting, because if you consider there's an HMS Cossack and an HMS Tata there, so theoretically the Royal Navy is planning on building links with Soviet Russia. <laughs> or there, do you think Stalin would have actually allowed them to go and visit their tribes and get awards? I'm not sure. The example I give is HMS Ashante. She's tribal class, she goes to Freetown, she goes and makes, uh, meets the tribe which are connected with the Santa tribe. And what's interesting, she's blessed by their priests, their high priests, and also by their king. Their king who'd only actually returned from exile two years previously, that after he rebelled against the Brits, we kicked him out. And then we allowed him in. Two years later, he's blessing one of our warships. There is some real, real politics going on there somewhere, but it's of a high kind. HMS Ashante is interesting because she's the one who survives of the tribal class. Four of them survive World War II. She's the one who survives most intact. So I now believe every single Royal Navy warship should be given a silver, a silver bell and a golden shield from the Ashante tribe and blessed by their priests. <laughs> because unlike HMS Of course, HMS Eskimo considered her bow to be an expendable item, going through free during the Second World War, often using it as an extra weapon when she needed elsewhere, uh, needed torpedoes and guns for other things. An HMS Nubian, named for a tribe which no longer existed, but which had dominated North Africa and probably because the Royal Navy couldn't call someone Carthage. So that might have pissed off the Italians a little bit too much. So they went for the Nubian, Nubian, and she actually racks up so many battle honours in the Second World War that if it hadn't been for War Spice experience in the First World War, Nubian would have overtaken her. So some of the amazing ships in the travel class, but this is what the Royal Navy was doing to try and bind the nation and, and the empire together. They had ships going out and visiting, interacting with people like Ashanti had done, like the cruisers were always going around and visiting nations, having the bars and diplomatic events. But they were also, by being a visible presence, were a visible deterrence. It was all about being out and being present in the world. For the Royal Navy, more than any other service, it was about being present to be a deterrent and about being visible. Now, I'll just add on because one of the questions I did actually the talk yesterday was on the subject of submarines and why I haven't discussed them more in the talk. Well, they were always part of the deterrent strategy, but they were never a deterrent, a visible deterrent. They weren't part of the peace building and the peace winning. They were about the part of the conflict deterring. Basically, submarines are a very strong, very flexible weapon of war. Of peacetime, they are more useful for intelligence gathering and covert things because their entire security, their ability to deter, lies in the fact that people don't know where they are. They know they're on patrol, they know they might be based not that far away, but they don't know where they are, and that is the unsettling thing. So, I hope you enjoyed the talk, I hope it was useful. If you have any questions, please contact me on Twitter. I'm always happy to respond. Take care and have a nice day.